Good morning. Good to see you. Hi, Kathy. Happy birthday, Jim. Good to see you all today. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Thanks for checking out Whiting Church this morning. I'm glad that you're taking a bit of your time to give God praise, to center and to reflect as we gather this Lenten season, awaiting the resurrection, the new life that Christ brings to all of us, a new creation in the world. But during Lent, we wait, we reflect, we look at our own selves and our own lives and how, how have we turned away from where God has called us to be. So this morning, I invite you to ask God's presence to be with us as we worship, to center your heart and mine as we journey towards the cross. Whatever kind of week you've had, the joys, the sorrows, if you're crabby right now or you're enjoying a good cup of coffee and some pancakes, know you are loved. God loves you. And you're welcome here in our community. Join us for worship. Just want to remind you at the end of the service today, we'll be having a time of Holy Communion. So if you'd like to gather some bread or a cracker, some juice or water, we'll be partaking in this Holy Sacrament on the first Sunday of the month. Now, I invite you to join us as we worship and sing, I Need Thee Every Hour.
invite you to pray this confession with me. Gracious and most merciful God, we come before you admitting that sometimes we're your bickering, complaining children. Yet you have showered us with love and affection. You have filled our lives with gifts of graciousness and new life. But we, in our selfishness and greed, we've turned away from you. We quarrel with you, O oh God. We test you. We want more and more. And we fail to trust you. So this morning, remove from us our hardened hearts of stone. Give us hearts of love to praise you, of thankfulness to serve you. Let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our lives be acceptable to you, O God, our Lord, our Redeemer. Forgive us. God, not only our own hearts that we turn to you once more, but we come with so much on our lives, concerns for others. So for those who are sick this morning, we pray your healing power. For those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, we pray for your comfort. For those eager and energetic to serve, God, we pray for boldness to speak your truth, to serve and be your hands and feet. And for all of us, this community of people who says we follow Jesus, turn us back to you again once more. Remind us of our call. Remind us that we are your children. Show us how to love, how to bring peace in this divided and broken world. 
God, you forgive. And we have faith. So with confidence, we pray the prayer that your Son, Jesus, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Often when I get into this spot and move over in this direction, I've got the camera just where I think it should be, and then I realize my head's cut off, or my belly is taking up a big thing of the camera, and it can do that sometimes. Um, so bear with me. Again, thanks for sticking around, and... And sharing in worship this morning. This is the third Sunday in Lent. A time where, where we've been remembering who we are. On Ash Wednesday, we remembered that God out of nothing created something. That from the dust of the earth, humans were brought up. And we're to remember that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Jesus went into 
the wilderness at the start of his ministry for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was still. And in his stillness and solitude and prayer, voices came, temptations came, Scripture says Satan came. And in those 40 days offered Jesus the whole world. All, you, all he had to do was turn to him. But Jesus remained still. Jesus remained calm. Jesus remained focused. Jesus remained one with God. And when Jesus came out of those wilderness moments, he began this ministry of healing, of love, of showing a different way of living. So much so that his very own followers had trouble following. The believers didn't quite believe. The religious authorities who should have listened wanted nothing to do with him and plotted to kill him. But he continued this journey to the cross. Continued this fulfillment of God's call in his life. With no guarantees that it was going to turn out okay. But yet, in Jesus' faithfulness, in his living of love and transformation. We know the end of the story, that resurrection moment. But sometimes, like during Lent, we just have to be still and reflect where have we gone from the past and how do we turn back together in love to be the people and the church that God has called us to be. I just kind of want us to sit with some scripture this morning. And I'll talk a little bit about it, but it kind of speaks for itself. The church in Corinth was one of the early churches after Jesus' resurrection. It was a church that Paul founded. And when we say church, we mean ecclesia, which is like this, this group of people. The called out ones. Those called out to leave, live a different kind of life. And in Corinth, which was a bustling metropolitan city, there were quite a few religions going on. In fact, paganism was huge, and there were thousands of gods that could be worshipped. And in in this metropolitan area where everybody's believing a whole bunch of different stuff, there's lots of hedonism going on. There's lots of sin going on. There's suffering going on. And Paul decides that this is where the called out ones should be. And so this community is beginning to form. But outside of this community, there's still all these influences of the culture. And Paul's saying it's almost, if you want to turn and follow Jesus, it's almost completely ridiculous. It's almost foolishness. The way culture and the world says to live versus the way Jesus does. And we hear these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 through 25. Paul says, for the message about the cross is foolishness. To those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish 
the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demanded a sign and Greeks desired wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those of us who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. God's weakness is stronger than human strength. It seems these days that we're all going in a bunch of different directions all at the same time. And for a long time in our society, we've been going a bunch of different directions. For some of us, Life might seem like the bumper cars at an amusement park. Everyone just going and colliding. For some of us, life might seem like this hamster wheel that never quite changes, never quite gets better. Over and over, same old, same old. For some of us, we've seen what we think are so many radical changes in the world in a very short period of time. We don't know what to do, and we're scared. Everything seems so different. We wake up, and everything sometimes changes. Yet at the same time, not a lot has changed at all. We continue the daily grind. The bumper car is going in lots of different directions. We may hit a few on the way, and then we wake up and we do it again the next day. Or we keep the grind on the hamster wheel just to keep it going, just to keep it moving, even though we're quite not moving anywhere. This church in Corinth, it was being pulled in a whole bunch of different directions. Those with Gentile upbringings, part of the Gentile and Roman culture, felt a certain way about this community. Those who were from a Jewish upbringing felt this Christian community should look like a certain way. But more so, not even being concerned with what the Christian community looked like, they were in their own, going their own direction, their own gods, their own way of life. And Paul's telling this community, this church, if they want to be the called out one, They've got to be fools for Christ. Because the Greek way of living wasn't doing it. Could be, it says, could be as wise, for since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. As much as we want to know the answers, as much as there were people in that city of Corinth, that were trying to speak wisdom, that were trying to speak truth, they were completely missing the point. And there were others demanding signs and wonders from God that things needed to be proved, and that was lived out through the law. And yet Paul's saying it's not that way either. And so I believe in, in this passage he's telling this early Christian community and telling us that even though the world throws so much at us in this direction and this direction from belief system, systems to politics to ideologies 
in Christ all of that is nothing. In fact, people are going to call you fools for believing this way. But he says in verse 23, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, a foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom I've been talking a lot about division. It's probably the last thing we want to hear in the church, yet it's such a reality in our society. It's such a reality in our nation, in our communities, in our workplaces, and for some of us, even in our homes right now. And division does nothing but create anger and chaos and fool continues to pull us apart. Division is what causes us to think that our way of life is the right way. That our way of thinking is the right way. That the way I spend my money is better than the way you spend your money. That my political side is right and your political side is evil. And when we say those things and we make those pronouncements, it just further divides, further breaks us up into tribes, into the other, further separating us from the path to the cross the path to resurrection, the path to new life. We say, oh, maybe that's not me. Maybe that's these institutions or just the media or just the church. But when we fail to forgive someone who's wronged us, we're continuing to divide. When we look at someone who has more money than us with envy and we hold on to our money tighter, that divides us more. When we've decided that my next door neighbor voted for someone who I don't agree with, I'm no longer going to talk to them. I'm no longer going to help them out. And it further divides us. And so on and so forth until we're divided and become separ so separated we become something other than what we're called to be. And as Jesus is beginning his ministry, after those wilderness moments, he looks to the temple, the religious authorities, and he goes to the temple. And when he gets there, in what should be a very holy place, because there has been so much separation, because there has been so much division, because there is no wisdom, because people have left the love and we're trying to debate the law. This is what happens. From John 2. It says the Passover of the Jews was near. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their temple, making a whip of cords. He drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. 
He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews said to him, what sign can you show for us in, this, in doing this? Jesus answered him, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, the temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of the body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The world had gotten so out of whack in Jesus' day that was supposed, what was supposed to be the most holy of holy places where people come to sacrifice, where people come to pray, became nothing but a marketplace, buying and selling of goods defeating the whole purpose of what the religion was about. And this is one of the few passages in Scripture where Jesus gets very angry. And he takes a whip, and he gets the animals out of the temple. He overturns their tables. He spills the coins of the money changers. What was going on? What had gotten so wrong that the holiest place, the temple, became this den of thieves, money changers. What happens in our lives where we think everything's going all right. Maybe we've been on that hamster wheel of life, going and going and going, and all of a sudden, things shift up on us, things change, and what was once bright and mountaintop experiences tend to become dark, and anxieties and fears build up in our lives, and we turn say, leave me alone. We say, I'm not good enough to be loved. We say, my way of living is the right and only way. We choose to drown our sorrows in things that hurt us rather than confronting reality and moving forward to new life. Jesus goes into the temple and it was anything that it should have been. Our churches have been closed for almost a year now. And as we're going through Lent, it seems to me this self-reflection, this turning back, this repentance. is not just an individual thing. But when we do come back soon, when our doors reopen soon, What are we showing? What are we offering? How are we sharing the love of Jesus in this place and in our neighborhood and encouraging each other in their own walks, encouraging each other in a life of peace, encouraging and building one another up to say, 
We can do it. We got this. You're not alone. I think it was Saint, uh, I, I, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said, the hospital, or I'm sorry, the church isn't a place for saints, but a hospital for sinners. What if when we return to church, it was a place where people could come and talk with one another, check in with one another, beyond fellowship and coffee, which are important, but to really see each other for who they are as children of God, to ask each other those deep questions, to walk alongside each other in those tough points in life. To not worry about just money to pay the bills, but sacrificial giving so we have more than enough to serve our community and world, so every mouth will be fed and every child will be clothed. How is Jesus clearing out our temple? What needs to be removed and refined and reformed for revival to take place in our church? These are the questions I hope that, I, that you have been pondering during this time as well as I have. But there's an interesting Part as we close. This passage of scripture about Jesus cleansing the temple is in all four Gospels. And it's short in the other three. But in John's Gospel, it's a little different. He adds something that's not in the other. And as he talks about seeing and witnessing what's going on in the temple and driving these evil forces out. In John 21, it says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. The temple of the body. If we want to get off the hamster wheel of life, if we want to stop being a bumper car ride, bumping into each other and colliding and not going in the same direction, if we want to create a community of love that goes out and makes disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, if we want to be the church God has called us to be, We must first look to ourselves. For we too are a temple. From dust we have come to dust we shall return. And this temple, our lives, our hearts, God is calling us back, calling us to turn around, calling us to let go of those things in our life that are hurting us. And to come back to the one who loves. Come back to the one who calls us home. Come back to the one who heals and restores. For if we want to have a great church, if we want to have a great neighborhood, if we want to have a great nation, each of us, must continue to turn back to Christ. Turn around. Confess. Reflect. How am I loving? How am I forgiving? How am I allowing God to heal my heart?
just real quickly, I've been attempting to practice what I preach and have been spending time in reflection and meditation this Lenten season. And I think it was Thursday, it had been a long week at school, and I was driving through North Hammond, and I parked my car, I had to stop for a minute. And when I got back in my car, it was about dusk. And there was this beautiful sunset, and the clouds moving just right. And I was awestruck yet again by the beauty and majesty of the one who calls us his children. And I took a moment to really think that even, even though everything on one side has seemed so upside down lately, everything is tense and People are tense. This last year, I celebrated in a wedding the marriage of a beautiful couple from my youth group. Last week, I got to go and visit this beautiful little girl, Eric's daughter. And I've known Eric since he was 18. And we've been through a lot together. And seeing Eric with his six-month-old, I saw the face of God. And this week, another young man who I've worked with has worked really hard and saved up money and didn't think he could do it, but he bought his own house and invited me over to come and pray at his house. In this last year of the pandemic, I have seen people giving food, people checking in on their neighbors, People shoveling out others from snow who couldn't do it themselves. And all that to say that I'm really realistic about the state of the world. But God is present and God continues to bless and God continues to love and God continues to work miracles in our lives and in our world each and every day and we can see it, and we can experience it, and we can be a part of it if we decide we will continue to follow that path with Jesus to the cross. We have to look beyond our divisions. We have to look beyond our own selfish needs and wants and the way we think the world should be. But if we're willing to confess to be still, to let go of the stuff that hurts us, we will see the face of God and be renewed. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This morning we have the opportunity to share in the sacrament of Holy Communion. that ties us, that binds us, that unites us together. Where there is no Jew or Greek, black or white, but we are all one, one in Christ Jesus. And on the night in which he gave up his life, for us, he took bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, 
This is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, blessed it, said, This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often you, as you drink it, do so and remember me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we praise his name and join his unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of his glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. My friends, pour out, O oh God, your Holy Spirit upon us, gathered here upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, as Christ was redeemed for the world. Make us one with many, one with Christ, as we feast with him at this heavenly banquet. And proclaim that mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. My friends, the body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. I'd like to close out our service with a song this morning. But it has to do with our passage. May you be blessed this week. Go knowing that God loves you. Go with the strength of the bread and the wine. The power of Christ that transforms you and the world. Take it wherever you go. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Like a man comes to the altar, I came into this town with the world upon my shoulder and promises passed down. I went into the water, my father he was pleased. Yes, I found thieves and salesmen living in my father's house. I know how they got in here, and I know how to get them out. I'm turning this place over from floor to balcony. And then, just like these doves and sheep, I'll stay.
I'll bring the bread and the wine, and we'll have us a party where all the drinks are made. As surely as the rising sun, oh, you will be set free. Oh, you will be set free. My friends, go be set free in Christ to love and to serve. Amen.